we are at Ephesians chapter four, and I hope you've been enjoying the treasures as you've been reading the Bible on your own. I wanna encourage you to keep reading every word. There is so much there for you and for me. And again, as we look at Ephesians four, five, and six, we're about to get super practical. God is about to take us where the rubber meets the road and how to live out this life that God has given us, how to experience the best life. He showed us what to believe, and now he's really helping us know how to live it. And so we want to look together beginning in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So many truths in that one verse alone. Here we find Paul again, just like last week, talking about his situation of being a prisoner. And we learned last time that when Paul talked about being a prisoner, understand he knew who held his heart captive. He knew that God was his authority and Christ was in control. But he also is a physical prisoner at this time. He is in prison because he was speaking the good news of Jesus. And it would make a lot of sense to be in that dark situation full of uncertainty and suffering that Paul would want to warn us, hey, don't follow my footsteps. You don't want any part of what I'm experiencing. Or it might have made sense if Paul had said, hey, you know what? Just be safe. I want you to be happy. No, Paul calls us right into it. Paul calls us to follow God and the calling on our lives. In that moment, Paul is not less passionate. He is more passionate. And I think about our lives right now in this coronavirus reality where there's so much uncertainty and we found ourselves, many of us, shut in or in lockdown or social distancing. It would be easy to begin to gravitate towards comfort or to look for what could make me happy. And none of that's bad, but do we forget our calling? Paul says, no, no. Walk right into it. That calling is from God. Our circumstances may sting us, but it will not stop us because we are called. You are called by God. You have been called by God and God has a mission and assignment for your life. I like definitions. One definition of calling is a divine assignment. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the fact that you're still on this earth means that God has a divine assignment with your name on it. He tells us, in fact, Jesus' very own words in Matthew 28 was to go and tell others the good news of Jesus. You've been saved. Now walk other people to the Savior. We have a divine calling on our life. Ephesians 2.10, if we back it up, also impacts this assignment. God He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God has plans for you and it's a divine assignment and he will give you the power to walk that thing out. But we've got to embrace our calling. We've got to understand our purpose. You and I will never experience the best life if we do not understand the purpose for which we live. God has a purpose for you and for me. Another great definition of calling is a strong urge and a commitment to a certain cause, career, or life path. Understand any true calling is fueled by passion. And as people who follow Jesus, our calling is driven by love. When you look at the very first commandment in the Bible, God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. God is our number one, and we are driven in our calling by love for Him. That's not out of duty. Our calling's not out of obligation. It is because, God, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. And what happens is that we then begin to overflow and love others. That calling to love others is a natural overflow of the love of God in our lives. When Jesus is my number one, when he is my number one love, his calling on my life will be number one. I will begin to love the things that Jesus loves. But sometimes, let's be honest, our calling can go wrong. Our calling can become confused. 
What are some of the ways that we'll know, hey, my calling's gone wrong? I do believe confusion is a great indicator when I don't really understand my purpose in this life. Another way that our calling goes wrong is when we don't understand God's design. I don't really know the way God has created me to live out this life. Another way, an example of calling gone wrong is when I'm pursuing my plans versus God's plans. I'm pursuing my calling versus God's calling. And finally, another way that we know, wait, I'm my calling has gone wrong, is we find ourselves driven by things like pleasure, and I just wanna be happy, and driven by comfort or by ease. We're driven by these things. When God says, I want you to be driven by me, driven by my spirit, not my kingdom, but God's kingdom drives us. We want to have his calling secure on our lives. And there's so many ways that the calling of God on our lives can express itself. Depends on where you are and where God has placed you. Maybe part of your calling is being a mom or part of your calling is that you're someone's daughter. A calling on your life may be a wife or you have a role at your job or a calling on your life is tied to some talents and gifts that God has given you. And I can assure you, as Paul's about to tell us, you have a calling on your life when it comes to God's church. There are so many expressions of calling, but ultimately, God, how do I live worthy of it? Because Paul tells us, live worthy of your calling. How do we live worthy? Well, let's keep going. And Paul unpacks it in Ephesians 4, verse 2. Always be humble. We can't even go any further if we don't understand that word. Right after he tells us to live worthy of the calling, he says, the first thing I have to share with you is be humble. Be humble. Humble, definition, it's not proud. Humble is knowing your place and knowing your situation. Can we all agree that the world is wild right now? And be real sweet in the comment section, but I mean, do we wear masks? Do we not wear masks? Do we shut down? Do we open up? This state is doing that, and that state over there is doing something different. What is it that we're supposed to do? It's such a time of mixed messages. And as we look at the landscape of our current world and nation and even city, people begin to fall into two camps. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of different direction and opinion, but no one person really knows. What do we do in those situations? If not careful, it's the perfect opportunity for pride to sneak in because pride always divides. The enemy has a much bigger plan than just a physical virus when it comes to your life and mine. He wants to divide us. And so in the middle of uncertainty, in the middle of Christ followers trying to seek God with wisdom and discernment in faith, we need to understand that God, we need to have a humble heart as we walk it out in a practical way way. God give us a humble heart. There's several expressions of pride. Let's hit on them. A couple of them help us really understand it. An expression of pride that's common is that we think of ourselves as better than we are. This is the pride that comes to mind most readily. And that is that that thought of ourselves that is so great. That is that thought of ourselves that my way is better than your way. And ultimately, my way is better than God's way. When we slip into this expression of pride, we begin to judge others as less than. And God says, this is not who I want you to be. This is not my plan for you. Romans 12, 3, Paul wrote this. He said, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of yourself as better than you really are. But another expression of pride, it's a sneaky form of pride, is that we think of ourselves as less than we are. This is where we have mental tapes playing back our failures and looking at our lack. We compare ourselves to others and we judge them to be better than. What we don't understand is that whether you're in that form of pride where you're better or that form of pride where you're less, both are putting ourselves in shoes that only God can wear. He alone is judge. He alone knows the heart of people. And both of those expressions of pride end up being very self-absorbed. I'm thinking a lot about myself. God says, I want you to run to me, have a humble heart, let me be in charge. To combat pride, there's a couple things that'll help us. Know your place. Know who you are. God is the creator 
I am the created. I understand that he is the authority and I submit and surrender in humility to him. And secondly, know your situation. Understand the situation. God is perfect. I am not and neither are you. When we understand our situation, we begin to be free from pride and able to walk in the strength of humility. Everyone has sinned, Romans 3.23 tells us, and that is ground zero for understanding our situation. And also, this is so helpful to understand that as Christ followers, we still battle sin. When you accept Jesus, there's still a fight. Galatians 5.17 explains it. The sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. This is talking about the situation of a follower of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us, but the fight is daily. Those sinful desires will creep up. How do you and I have victory? We run to Jesus every day. Every day, we surrender our lives fresh to Him. He is our victory. But when you and I understand our situation, it helps us have compassion for others. We get it. We are in the same boat. There's no room to boast and there's no room to judge because anything good in me is from Christ's work in me. Humility is essential to living the best life. You can't embrace the rest of it if we don't first allow God to give us a humble heart. Continue going. Always be humble, verse two, and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Rather than harsh and impatient in our pride and condescending, God says, I want you to have a humble spirit, patient, kind, gentle, full of love. And I love this phrase, making allowances for each other's faults. Could we live this way? We don't have to call out every sin. We don't have to chase down every drama. God says there are spaces and time in your relationships where I want you to cover over that offense. I want you to love them and not judge them. That doesn't mean we don't have healthy conflict resolution. Sometimes we need to talk about an offense or sin when it happens. But it does mean that we're not the spiritual police. We are not women who stir the pot of conflict, that we work for peace, covering over one another with love. Ephesians 4 verse 3, he goes on to say, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. We have to work for peace. It requires effort. And God created us as His children to be united. Why? For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. Ultimately, at this point, Paul is talking about God's church. The rest of this passage, we're going to look intently at God's design for your life and mine in context of his church. Understand that the church is God's people. The church, if you're a Christ follower, that's you and that's me. And there's expressions of the church, too, that we'll look at. One is the global church. It's the universal church. That's every son, every daughter of God. But then there's also the local church. And that is part of God's design. A couple of things that mark a local church I want to share with you so you understand God's created order when it comes to church. When you have a body of believers that gather locally and they are a church, you will find this. They believe Jesus. Biblical leaders are in place. They are preaching the word of God. There is regular gathering. Baptisms are performed. Communion is experienced as a group. There is worship and praise, and that body of believers are on mission. We are seeking to those people who do not yet know God, and we want to introduce them to our awesome Savior. That is the local church, and the church is God's vehicle to make Jesus known and to lead everyone to a passionate life in Christ. Your calling is tied to God's church. And that is where you're going to experience power in your life. 
The church is also a body. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, starting in verse 12, Paul wrote this, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. It's a picture of the church as a body, that it is one body with many different parts. Paul, in in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, he begins to talk about how we each have different gifts. We each have different parts to play in the body of Christ. Verse 7, however, he, God, has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Isn't that amazing? You've been given special gifts. If you don't yet know what those are, begin asking him, praying, because he has given those to you for a reason. Going down to verse 11, and we'll look at some of these specific gifts to the church. Now, these are the gifts of Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. God created authority to be a blessing to your life. And God placed those leaders and that authority in the local church for this purpose, verse 12. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. God called you to do his work and build up the church. That is part of how God created you to live out this life. If you want to experience the best life, this may be an area where you say, God, grow me. I want to step into this purpose for my life. When I think about the gifts that we've been given, I want to, I want to help us because sometimes we'll begin to recognize gifts or talents that we have. And God opens doors for us to use that in many wonderful ways. Maybe you use it at your job or maybe in your PTA role. Maybe you use it with your kids' sports, or you use those gifts helping with school. Whatever those gifts and the way it expresses itself, those are gifts from God. But the reality is, if not careful, we'll use our gifts in many different ways, yet neglect God's church. Those are great gifts that God has given, but God says those gifts are also for my church. I have called you to build up my church. We don't want church and God's church to be on the back burner. Oh God, give us a heart for the thing that you love. We want to love your bride like you love your bride. And we'll be blessed when we line up with God's calling for our life. When God calls you to one thing, he will not call you to break his design in another thing. That is true for your gifts and talents and how you use those. But it's also true for things like family. God's not going to call you to be a mom and have you neglect your role as a wife. God is always true to his word. And you might ask, well, how do I know? How do I know? Read the Bible. When we understand God's design for life, he will help us walk out our calling. But whatever God says is immovable, understand we do not move it. We want to follow his path. As we continue reading in Ephesians 4, 13, The Bible says this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge, knowing God's son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. He's saying this will continue, this building up of the church, this leading out in this world through the body of Christ until we know him so well and we have become mature and who he is. Verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. God will grow and mature his people. I love the imagery God uses of child development, and it helps illustrate that God wants us to grow. And as a mom of four, I delight in seeing my children grow their different developmental stages. But it's important to understand that healthy bodies are growing bodies. God designed you and me to grow. It's an indicator of health. It is so sweet to feed that baby of mine a bottle when they are born. But it's not sweet if I'm still feeding a baby a bottle and they're 16. That's no longer the plan. And that is so true in our spiritual life. God wants us to develop. In verse 14, Then we will no longer be immature like children. 
We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. A couple signs of maturity from this passage. When we know God's word and understand his truth. When we know this word, when we understand what he is writing, that's a sign of growth and health in our lives. Another sign of maturity is that we recognize false teaching and are not influenced by lies. Our culture has a lot of messages and they can sound so close to the truth, even delivered with passion. But do we know the difference? Anybody out there just having smooth sailing with homeschooling? It may be going grand for you. I will say that that's an area where I have room to grow and we're doing it. We're all making our way through it. And some of us may be easier than others. But it was funny last week I was going through um, some classes with my youngest and I was helping her learn how to use her agenda. Bought her this really cute agenda with all these stickers and all these little cute, you know, just stickers she can put in her book for her different assignments. And she came across, because I'd gone through the stickers, she came across one of the sheets of stickers and she noticed that it said, believe in yourself, except that someone had made a line through the word believe on every sticker. There was a line that crossed out believe. And because my children know me, my youngest daughter looked at me and said, mom, why did you do that? And we laughed. But the reality is my kids know that there are phrases that sound so sweet, but ultimately you don't believe in yourself. You believe in God and who he's creating you to be. You can believe in him, and that gives you the ability then to believe in yourself. But I just wanted to give that little bitty reminder to make her think. And you know, while that's just a small little moment, I believe that we develop a lifestyle of being able to sift through what we hear and what we absorb and what we pass on to our kids. I don't want my kids to follow their heart. I want them to follow God's heart. We gotta recognize the truth. And we speak the truth in love, the Bible just said. We speak it in love. When we understand truth, we got to speak it in love. If we don't speak the truth in love, we're just being mean. God, give us your spirit as we walk out your truth. Verse 16, he keeps going. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Are you growing today or are you declining? Are you contributing to the health of your church body, your church? Are you making your church sick through gossip or disunity or grumbling or complaining? God, we want to be women who are healthy. Jesus, help us follow you. Verse 21, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by sin and deception. Throw off your sinful nature. As I read that passage, it's like a radical wardrobe change. God says there are things to throw off in our lives, but we want to put on God's nature. That word corrupted is to spoil or to taint. And if not careful, our sin will spoil the great life God has for us and it will taint our very souls. God says, throw it off, verse 23, instead. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Put on your new nature. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Anybody out there need an attitude check? And quickly, things that the Bible in this in this chapter says, throw off, verses 25 through 30. Don't lie, tell the truth. And those little white lies, they count. We wanna speak truth. The Bible in verse 26 says, don't let anger control you. Don't go to bed without dealing with that anger. Or literally, we open the door for Satan to come in. Stop stealing. Instead, give generously. Don't use foul, abusive language. Anything coming out of your mouth, let it be encouragement. Let it be true. And finally, don't bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God. Remember whose and who you are. 
finally in verse 31, we'll look at this closing passage. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior instead. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. As I read this passage, could we be women who live forgiven and who live forgiving, that we love the people around us? This life is fleeting. We don't have to look far in our culture today to understand that life is fragile. And we want to live this life without regrets, loving big, working for peace, having humble hearts, and carrying out the calling of God. Will you pray with me that God would help us to live a life and lead a life worthy of His calling? Oh God, the fact that you would call us to follow you that you would love us when we were so unworthy and that you, O oh God, make us righteous and right. You make us holy and pure. O oh God, we are amazed and it's with grateful hearts that we say thank you and we ask you to help us walk with a humble heart as we carry out the incredible calling on our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.